Hello, and welcome to Home Computing 1965, Gaming and Coding Before the Invention of the Microchip. Today we'll learn several very interesting aspects about pre-microchip computing, but one of the things you'll need to know up front is that you'll be able to tell people that either A, you saw this really great program, or B, you saw this really horrible program by a guy named Dr. Silas Conundrum, who had a company called STEM Punk Ed. I founded this company with my two young children, as we always love to study STEM topics, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but we've done so using technology from the 17th century to the early 20th century, anything before the evil laziness of the microchip. Or as I like to say, we teach how STEM was done for the 500 years that came before the last 50 years. One of the things you'll be able to talk about when you walk away is you'll give a really great definition of what a computer is. A computer is a device that blank and has a system for blank. You'll be able to say what base language all computers, both those in 1965 and the most modern computers today, whether they're in your hand as a cell phone or in front of you on a desktop, what language they use. You'll be able to talk about some really cool similarities and differences between computers, gaming, and programming today versus 1965. And you'll be able to name at least three things that surprised or amazed you about home computing in 1965. So this is the world's smallest computer in 1965. It was the digital PDP-8. Let's give you some idea of just how small this computer was. Here is an advertisement of the time showing you roughly how big the PDP-8 was. And you would say, hmm, that doesn't look too big. It looks like it's about the size of a desktop PC. Well, this really wasn't the whole computer. But if you look at it here, still not the whole computer, it did fit inside the back of a Volkswagen Bug, one of the smallest cars of the time. But in either configuration, this computer would not work without all of its peripherals, memory, storage, input, and output. So this was more its realistic size. Let's talk about what this computer was capable of. Well, first of all, in 1965, this smallest computer would have cost $18,000. In today's money, that would be equal to $140,000. It had a screaming four kilobytes of RAM. And trust me when I say most of you can't even think small enough to get an idea of what four kilobytes is, but hold on a moment. It had 256 kilobytes of storage and could do around 300,000 instructions per second and would take up around 200 square feet of space altogether. And to give you some idea of how big a single kilobyte is, one kilobyte is equal to 0 0.0000001 gigabyte, or in other words, one billionth of a gigabyte. Yet at the time, this was considered pretty fast and pretty powerful. So if the smallest computer was $18,000, how did children, and for that matter, grown-ups, have any hope of learning about computers at home, learning how to program them, and learning how to play games on them? Well, that is what we're here to learn, after all. So let's, first of all, make a definition that we can use in our exploration. What is a computer? So please pay attention to this video because the definition of a computer will be given to you as well as a couple of other key points we'll be coming back to many times in this presentation.
What exactly is a computer? A computer is an electronic device that manipulates information or data. The computer sees data as ones and zeros, but it knows how to combine them into more complex things, such as a photograph, a movie, a website, a game, and much more. Modern computers are revolutionizing our lives, performing tasks unimaginable only decades ago. Well, at their core, all computers are just what the name implies, machines that perform mathematical operations. The earliest computers were manual counting devices, like the abacus, while later ones used mechanical parts. What made them computers was having a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. What made them computers was having a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. On modern computers, the numbers that are manipulated at the very base level are the numbers 0 and 1. Keep those numbers in mind for later. Those numbers are machine language. Whatever computer you're on, whether it's a Mac or a PC, whatever mobile device you have, whether it's an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy, whether you play on an Xbox or a PlayStation, at the very core, all of those machines are operating using the machine language of zeros and ones. And by combining those operations together with very specific instructions, those zeros and ones become movies, become games, become websites, and become photos. So let's review. A computer is a device that has a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. Manipulation being moving them, changing them, somehow reordering them and instructing them to do certain things. Now let's take a look at something you may not recognize as a computer, but does meet this definition and for its time was considered one of the most powerful computers in the world. It's called a differential analyzer and this particular one was at the University of California at Los Angeles. Let's take a look at this 1931 mechanical computer. The University of California at Los Angeles, one of America's top flight educational institutions, did much to bring victory in World War II with its important scientific contributions. Complex as UCLA's cyclotron is its new differential analyzer. This amazing mechanical brain quickly solves mathematical problems that would require months by ordinary computing methods. Gears of many types introduce coefficients combined to give various ratios. The analyzer can juggle them all without breaking a single formula. Qualities are represented by revolving shafts. The highly versatile machine adds, subtracts, multiplies, divides, integrates, and puts arbitrary functions into the problem, all mechanically. Now, engineering students can concentrate on other important matters. For the thinking machine not only answers questions, it actually draws the solutions, charting the function of each variable. After the machine has turned over a problem in its mind, the answer is delivered at one of the output tables. So that mere humans won't misinterpret the solution, it is plotted with automatic recording pens. This is truly one of science's great achievements. I would be willing to bet that none of you would have recognized this device as a computer given what you know today. But it was and it completely meets the definition. First of all, I'd like you to keep in mind that those gears and shafts that you saw them assembling into the device, that was programming. Mechanical programming I give you, but still programming nonetheless. Each of those gears would represent some type of number and some type of function that would be performed on that number. And by assembling the machine in different ways, you could carry out different programs to solve different equations. So the machine did have a way to represent numbers using the gears and shafts and a way to manipulate them, 
running all those gears and shafts that then would create the result and the answer to an equation. Now jumping ahead a bit, something that you would recognize a little more as a computer is the first electronic computer called the ENIAC. The ENIAC was primarily used by the US military to calculate ballistics, that is to say, firing large shells from cannons or smaller ones from rifles or pistols to predict their behaviors. Let's introduce ourselves to the ENIAC. ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was the world's first large-scale digital electronic general purpose computer. It was designed to be capable of being reprogrammed to solve a large number of numerical problems. The ENIAC weighed over 30 tons, it had a total of 40 panels, and utilized 18,000 vacuum tubes, with 70,000 resistors and 10,000 capacitors. Its computing speed was 1,000 times greater than that of electromechanical machines. ENIAC was conceived and designed by John Mockley and J. Presper Eckert of the University of Pennsylvania. They headed up a team of engineers and others that worked on the ENIAC project, which begun in 1943. The team that worked on the ENIAC included a large number of women who were instrumental in the detailed task of manually programming this giant machine. Programming was accomplished by setting switches and connecting wires according to specific instructions which were first worked out on paper and then carefully carried out and tested. In addition to switch panels and wiring panels, ENIAC used an IBM punch card reader for input and an IBM card punch machine for data output. The timing of these machines was synchronized with the operation of the ENIAC itself. A typical ballistics calculation that previously might have taken 12 hours using a desktop mechanical calculator could now be done in just 30 seconds. Here, one of the development team reads ballistics data output. So the ENIAC, different from the differential analyzer, but still very similar, instead of using gears and shafts, it used connectable wires and switches. And to change the programming around, you would connect the wires and change the switches in different ways to enter the information and to create a program for solving it. So the way of representing numbers would have been the specific set of switch and plug alignments. And the manipulation would have been how the system then processed the electric impulses through that arrangement to solve an equation. So again, what is a computer? It is a device that has a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. Now, this is the world's first modern computer, the IBM System 360. In 1965, when this machine was introduced, the world trembled. This was the computer that was somehow going to take over the world and rule us all. And it truly was the most powerful computer available in the world and dominated the computing industry for a number of years. In 1965, the cost for this machine would have been $5,500,000. Today's cost, $45 million. It had a screaming eight megabytes of RAM, quite a step up from the four kilobytes earlier, 40 megabytes of storage, which was more than enough to hold information about most people and what they knew, had, could do 16.6 .6 million instructions per second and would probably be the size of two to three combined classrooms. Let's take a look just to give you some idea of how different computing was back in the 60s, of what RAM looked like. Now, I'm sure you're used to thinking of RAM, if you are at all, as a chip on a computer board, a silicon chip. Well, again, I'd like to emphasize that the microchip itself had not been invented yet, nor could anyone work with anything so small as the scale of microchips. What they used was something called magnetic woven core memory. 
which is essentially the same thing as looking at a window screen and as having little tiny magnets at each intersect. Let's take a closer look at this window screen of RAM for the IBM System 360. In this tiny space, you would have exactly 128 kilobytes, one one millionth of a gigabyte. And in this small space, you would have had exactly 1,024,000 cores, each one capable of holding a single bit of information known as a binary digit, or the number zero or the number one, which keep in mind is what's happening in your most modern machine at its most basic level for you to stream a movie or play a game. This is what the magnetic woven core memory would have looked like at the time. And again, you can see round magnets that would have held either the zeros or the ones for data. So that eight megabyte window screen we're looking at in 1965, that would have cost over $300,000. In today's costs, it would have been over two and a half million dollars just for eight megabytes of memory. Let's compare, just for fun, the IBM System 360 to this laptop that I'm presenting to you on. In 2019, the cost of my computer was $878 roughly one five thousand one hundredths of the cost of the System 360. It had 20,000 times the RAM of the IBM 360, 2 million times the storage, 100,000 times the instructions per second, and takes up quite a bit less than one square foot of the IBM System 360's 3,000 square feet. Oh, how things have changed thanks to miniaturization. Let's take a moment to look how modern computers work. And please keep in mind that even though this film is quite dated, it is still the basis for how all modern computing takes place. You may not realize it, but the chances are that a machine such as this one has already affected your everyday life. Complex as they look, electronic computers operate on a very simple principle. Being electronic, they have circuits that can be opened or closed, switches that can be off or on. Its understanding and its answers are limited to these two possibilities. Since this is true, how can we translate reams of data, thousands of words, complicated formulas, into the yes-no signals that the computer can understand? The answer is binary arithmetic, a system that uses only two digits, one and zero. Information to be fed into a computer is often encoded on cards, then transferred to magnetic tape for input to the computer. Holes punched in the cards represent the letters, numbers, and symbols. This data can be recorded on magnetic tape by magnetic recording heads, whose poles may be north or south, corresponding to one and zero. If data is fed into a computer from paper or plastic tape, groups of holes punched in the tape represent decimal and letter symbols. This data is stored in the computer's memory unit for use in solving problems. Tiny magnetic cores threaded on wires store one bit on each core. A current of electricity passing through a core sets up a magnetic field that may be clockwise or counterclockwise, corresponding to one or zero. In solving a problem, data in a magnetic core memory is stored, recalled, compared, calculated, checked, and restored at a rate of many thousands of calculations per second. The control unit directs each step according to the program punched in the tape. Thousands of electric circuits like these in the arithmetic unit connect transistors that act as switches. The transistors are seen here as silver cylinders in the center. For storage of data on rotating disks mounted like records in a record machine. Minute spots magnetized on the drum surface represent ones. Unmagnetized spots, zeros. 
Regardless of appearance, all electronic computers operate on the same basic principle, using simple language of coded signals, signified by circuits that are off or on. The productive activity of people in the future will to a large extent rest in their knowledge of computers and how to use them. So working backwards from some of the things you've seen there, the rotating records for the hard disks, those are exactly the same in operating principle as the hard disks in your computers today. Really, all that's written on those for every one of your programs and every one of your photos are simply zeros and ones, binary arithmetic. It's just the computer, through instructions, knows how to manipulate those numbers to become something you recognize as real computer. You may also be asking, now wait a minute, they were using punched cards to enter information into a computer and punched tapes? Why didn't they just use a keyboard? Or for that matter, a mouse? Well, the answer is this. No one had yet invented a way for a keyboard to talk to a computer, nor had they invented a way for the information on a computer to be displayed on a screen. Your only way of working with a computer was to use punch cards and punch tape to enter information in and then look at long paper readouts on the other side to see what happened. So, binary is the language of all computing devices, even what's inside your toaster or your refrigerator that keeps it running and keeps temperature managed, that is still zeros and ones and is binary operating language. Let's learn about it. Welcome to Math Bytes. Today we'll talk about binary numbers, also known as base two. Base two is an alternate way of expressing numbers, which has many applications, including that the device upon which you are currently watching this video speaks at its very core a language in binary code. Ones and zeros, baby. It's true, the image you see is not really me, rather a base two representation of this so-called me. But before we can understand binary numbers, we should take a closer look at our own decimal number system, the good old familiar base 10. In base 10, we have 10 symbols at our disposal for representing numbers. As you know, in various combinations, the symbols can represent any number of objects we can think of, using something called place value, which gives us a lot more bang for the buck for a mere 10 little symbols, if you know what I mean. Each column of numbers represents multiplication times the power of 10. There's the ones place, 10 to the zero power, tens place, 10 to the one power, hundreds place, 10 to the two power, and so on. So when you see a number like 375 in base 10, you're really seeing this. Most of the world uses these symbols along with powers of 10 and has for a long, long time. It's a great system. In binary, instead of using 10 symbols and powers of 10, we use just two symbols and powers of two. And we can still express big numbers using just two symbols. Base two or binary works the same way as the decimal system. But this time, each column of numbers represents multiplication times the power of two. There's the ones place, two to the zero power, twos place, two to the one power, fours place, two to the two power, and so on. Of course, it's a lot harder to express big numbers this way. You need a lot more digits. So if it's that inefficient, why do computers use it? Well, it's how they store and relay information. Because the core of computers is just electronics after all. And for any given pathway on a circuit board, either a current is flowing or it's not. Yes, no, on, off, one, zero, binary. You're hot. So, hopefully that, at least, put it into your minds that zeros and ones are the root of computer operations, and that base two math, or binary math, is used to translate zeros and ones into numbers that we would recognize in base 10. And the reason why computers work in base two rather than base 10 is that when electronics are working, when it comes right down to it, Electricity is on or it is off, but how you control those on-offs can create your experience of computing today. In person, I would demonstrate binary much more understandably using this wooden binary marble calculator. I have actually two of them and we would work together for me to show you exactly how binary operates. 
To learn more about binary operations, and in particular the history of binary behind modern computing, as well as the process for converting between base 10, or the digits 0 through 9, and base 2, the digits 0 and 1, please visit my website, stempunked.com. From that website, you'll be able to click on our free resources page, and towards the top of that page, you will find a video that explains all of this in more detail. It will be titled, Computer History and Hands-On Binary. Now, the zeros and ones by themselves aren't enough to actually accomplish something. Remember how we said that you not only have to have a way to represent numbers, but a system for manipulating them. And that manipulation that converts zeros and ones into simple things like calculators and into complex things like our modern computers is something called Boolean logic, which is the logic of computers. And by arranging circuits in a computer following the rules of Boolean logic, also called Boolean algebra, we are able to achieve the amazing things that we expect from our computers today. Let's learn a brief bit about Boolean logic. So, the primary terms in Boolean logic that computers use, though they use more, are basically the conjunctions OR and 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 NOT. What do these things actually mean when you use them in a computer? Let's look at it in more detail. Using Boolean operators. Brought to you by CSUSB's John M. Pfau Library. In this video, we'll demonstrate how to use the Boolean operators AND, OR, and NOT. Using these operators can help narrow or broaden your searches in the library's databases. An easy way to narrow your search is to use the word AND between two or more keywords. Though AND is the default for most databases and you typically will not have to type it out, it's useful to know how it works. AND retrieves only those results that contain all of your keywords. For example, a search for cat AND dog will retrieve only those results that contain both keywords, not simply one or the other. However, if you want to expand your search, use the Boolean operator OR, cat OR dog. This technique will allow you to retrieve results that contain the keywords cat, dog, or cat and dog. For a more sophisticated search, combine the Boolean operators AND and OR. For example, let's say we want results about cats or dogs or birds, but we also want these results to address animal welfare. First, we would place parentheses around cats or dogs or birds as if it were a mathematical equation. We would then add animal welfare using the Boolean operator AND. Finally, you can use the Boolean operator NOT to exclude keywords from your search results. For example, if I want to retrieve information about animals but not dogs, I would search like this, animals not dogs. And even though I actually love dogs, using NOT eliminates what I don't want, saving me time and energy I would have otherwise spent combing through my results. So that is a brief introduction to Boolean operators and Boolean logic. And you may be saying to yourself at this point, wait a minute, this program is supposed to be about home computing in 1965. Well, you'll see in a moment why I'm taking the time to talk to you about binary operations and Boolean logic, because those played a very significant part in early learning and playing on computers. For more information on Boolean operators, please visit my website, stempunked.com, click on free resources, and scroll down until you see the video, Boolean Logic Ice Cream. You'll learn more about Boolean operators, their role in computer systems, and how to use Boolean operators to order your favorite ice cream. That's a lot of high concept, but 
Take heart, you now know more about how computers operate today than most anyone else around you, unless of course they happen to be computer engineers. And you needed to know a lot of this stuff in 1965 because when you played with home computers, when you worked with home computers, at that time, you were handling operations at the binary level and through Boolean logic. And you would learn those using devices that had no electricity at all in many cases. But we will look at the home computing devices that children and adults would have worked with in the 60s. Now, in a live program that I would bring to your location, I have all of these devices we're about to talk about. And they would be set up in your room so that everyone could have hands-on time using these computing devices from the 60s that children and adults would have used. And do keep in mind that the founders of the computer revolution, the move to digital that made the world we take for granted today possible, this is how they began learning to do the things that made our world what it is today. First, something called the Digicomp 1. Electronic computer brain, it says, though there was no electricity involved. The machine you see here, there are binary inputs and outputs, as you see by the ones and zeros, that you will see various um, ver vertical lines that indicate switches, also for on and off. And on the opposite side, there would be these little posts that you would take pieces of straw and hook onto. And if you put a piece of straw on, that would be a binary one. If there was no piece of straw, a binary zero. As you move the device, little switches would be triggered, processing the zeros and ones. The movements would be considered computer clock cycles or processor clock cycles, and they would process information creating inputs and outputs read in three binary digits. And this would not be just math. You could even create logic problems and riddles that the machine could then solve, or you could solve using it based on your inputs. So you would have time with the Digicomp 1. The Digicomp 2 took the very idea a bit farther. What you see here in red are the various binary switches zero and one switches to represent binary numbers and decimal equivalents. You will also see some lighter colored switches as well as a number of pathways carved into this wood. Those pathways represent Boolean operations and or and not circuits. And the balls you see at the top, the ball bearings, those would be like electrons or electricity flowing through a circuit. So young aspiring programmers would sit down with the Digicomp 2, program it by flipping the various switches to create binary numbers, by moving other switches to direct paths for binary, or excuse me, for Boolean logic, and then you would run the program by releasing these balls that would follow the paths you programmed it for binary and Boolean to do mathematical problems. The amazing Dr. Nim. Now this was a gaming device for the time. Here you see a device that has several paths. In the center towards the top, something that looks like birds flying were binary switches and a few other switches throughout. This game was played called Last Marble you do not want to be caught with the last marble. You would get 15 marbles you'd load in the top tray. You would set up the binary switches in a very specific manner for the first game, and you would play against the machine itself. You and the machine would take turns choosing one, two, or three marbles. And after every turn you took, the machine would then take its turn dropping one, two, or three marbles. And using the normal programming, you would lose every time you played this game. And the goal was to figure out how the binary switches directed the marbles 
through logic gates, as you see, there are different paths that you could go through here to create a program, again, a Boolean operator program using binary inputs so that you could win the game against Dr. Nim. Thinkadot. Thinkadot was trying to teach you how an invisible closed system made up of zeros and ones represented by colors blue and yellow, how you would have to figure out the binary state behind those colors by dropping marbles in three slots at the top in order to create a certain binary output or patterns of blue and yellow dots using only a certain number of electron drops, marble drops, into the system. This also turned out to be, once you were ready to go to the next level, a calculator in what's called octal, which is base eight operations. So you could use this as a game to understand both base two and base eight math, as well as certain logical principles of when you drop a ball here, it creates an and or flipping of the gates inside. One of my personal favorites, an electronic version called the Geniac or Brainiac, depending on what era you bought it in. In the 50s, you would take these basically plywood discs and wire them up together with switches to create computer programs. And again, you could play a game like Dr. Nim, but it was called Last Match. We're given a set number of matches. You would have to play against the computer, which was again, just disks and switches with wiring behind, and you could never win the game because you would always be caught with the last match. You could also make several other programs. Space Pirates is what you see on here, or Uranium Pirates, I'm sorry. Um, was a, it was a space battle game. And you may say to yourself, uh, where is the video screen? How could anyone be entertained by this? Trust me, for the time, deeply entertaining. If you were an adult and you were trying to learn about computing, you would have been given one of these either to use at work or potentially take home to teach yourself overnight, called the Minivac 601. If you will look closely, you will see various holes as well as buttons and switches on this device. That was how you programmed it. We'll take a step back here. Remember that, sorry, that remember that the ENIAC was programmed entirely using patch cables or wires that you could plug in different ways and switches. You would learn to program a small computer just like the ENIAC was using this device at home. You will see across the top boxes. In those boxes were what were called electromagnetic relay switches. Each of those switches could hold in its memory either a zero because the switch was opened or a one because the switch was closed and allowed electricity to pass through it. The, what you're looking at here, this is a six bit computer that you could use to solve problems, create logical situations, and control various inputs and outputs. This one called the Adometer was a mechanical calculator that you would enter numbers in using dials. You would enter number positive values going right, negative values going left, and doing so, and remembering some basic principles of math, you could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division using this lovely little machine. Another one called the Science Fair Electronic Computer. This would come in a kit completely unassembled. You would learn to solder the wires behind this system as well as the other electronic components together to create programs that would then be represented by disks on the front and inputs would be represented by turning dials to input specific numbers. And using this device, you could perform calculations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, as well as create logic programs to say, figure out what the gas mileage is on various trips based on how much fuel, how much distance, and how much fuel consumption. 
This was what I had as a kid. It was called the Radio Shack Computer Fair Kit or Digital Computer Kit. It worked again the same way as the Minivac 601. There are switches at the bottom creating logical operations and you would wire into the various terminals you see across the top in different configurations to create calculators, diagnostics for health problems, as well as binary to decimal converters, and I think a total of 60 different possible projects. And Data Avalanche, a game in which you have binary switches, you would drop marbles in through the top holes if a marble would land in a position that held, the switch would hold the marble, it would be a one. If the marble would pass past the switch, it would be a zero, but then would cause the one marble that was originally in the switch to move down the system and then create another situation where you either had a one or a zero. And you would win by taking these data cards that you see in the bottom left that specified marble colors, in the one that's visible, it would be orange and yellow, and you would drop marbles through in a way to predict which switches would pass your marbles or electrons through the system quickly enough to get the data result you wanted. In this case, the data being the color of the marble. And last, but certainly not least, the computing device that had a major role to play in all STEM activities for 350 years, the slide rule. Hands down, the most common personal portable computer that every STEM professional would have around her or himself at all times. So that, my friends, is an introduction to Home Computing 1965, Gaming and Coding Before the Microchip. I would sincerely love to have the opportunity to bring all of these pieces of equipment to you in person so you can learn how the world was before the way it is now. So thank you for your time. Again, my name is Dr. Silas Conundrum and my company, STEM Punk Ed, helps students and adults experience what the world was like before the invention of the laziness of the microchip. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful day.